My name is Joni Murphy, and I'm the author of Double Teenage. It actually came from a joke that I kind of made to my friends about how being in my 30s, I felt not like a grown-up, but kind of two teenagers in one, or that I had like returned to a teenage self, but doubled, um, which I think, you know, it's like the, maybe it's a generational thing of not really identifying as an adult, um, but also a sort of, yeah, teenage intensity comes back, but you have more critical distance when you're 30, but you still, or in your 30s, but you still feel some of those things. And the book is a lot about like revisiting my teenage self with my adult criticality awareness. I grew up on the, you know, very close to the U.S.-Mexico border on the U.S. side. Um, and I felt, you know, like coming, it felt like coming from the the bottom of the country, but the top of another country. Um, New Mexico has been a part of Mexico. It has this other country's like name in its name. Um, so kind of it's like feeling on the wrong side of the border, but it's the right side, the richer side, the more kind of dominant. The U.S. is so much more dominant. Um, and then I moved to Canada and that, that sort of idea of like uh, so much of the Canadian population being really close to the U.S. border, but then it's like this other side to be. So these experiencing border cities or border kind of feelings and then how that crosses over, you know, a lot of the philosophy and theory that I studied having to do with the borders of the body and this idea of, you know, individuality and distinct, like, coherent self, and then the rest of the world, like, other things and other people. So, at, especially at this time, the way that U.S. politics are, and this sort of, to me, it feels like a very, um, so much insecurity that people project onto the border and they project onto people on other sides of the border. And that sort of violence to me is also like not being able to accept one's own porous qualities. Um, so I really wanted to collapse the idea of like the physical body and the, the body politic or the state as a place with borders um, and sort of say like, we are playing, like if we think that we're individuals with this nice, clean border, we're kidding ourselves. <laughs> I was really trying to sort out some of the violence. I feel like I've always been in proximity to violence, but feel like, for the most part, I've been very lucky to not experience directly, but I think there was a big question of, um, ambient violence, this kind of, um, it, like the city of El Paso, Texas is, is basically one half of a mega city and the other side is Juarez. And, you know, this whole thing of like Juarez is so violent and it has been and, but then El Paso in the same time would sort of say, we're the most safe city in Texas or you know we've only had eight murders this year and I didn't kind of understand how you could how people in that city could sort of claim some view of safety when they were you know proximity it has to mean something um and in I talk about in the book Vancouver as well this sort of these views of safety where there's kind of un discussed violence going on and, um, you know, domestic violence, like intimate partner violence and family violence, you know, there's so many layers of violence that kind of are sort of like, oh, well, that happens, but we don't mean it in that way, you know, like you're safe, 
but um, you know, violence is trauma that kind of echoes out through generations and through cities. So I felt like if we didn't talk about the violence, it's kind of allowed to, it has such a detrimental effect on all of us, um, but we don't. It's like, well, you didn't experience that directly, so you're okay. And sort of like, well, none of us are really okay because all of this violence keeps happening, whether it's, you know, intimate family violence or state level violence. Like New Mexico is also a huge, um, there's a lot of military testing and military bases. And so, uh, you know, <laughs> if you want to be really critical, it's like the United States is, operates on many levels of violence. So to sort of say that we're, that violence is only an issue if you're directly involved, it's kind of like, at every layer, there's some violence that we're ignoring, which I kind of, I can't handle. So the characters, when they are young, uh, have um, a sort of babysitter slash um, idol, like a girl they really look up to um, as being a sort of artistic, talented, creative, older girl. Um, and you sort of hear about her and then in the early parts she is actually like, she's murdered, but you don't, as a reader, you only hear it as the girls would hear it in this sort of veiled way because it's like the way that adults talk to children about violence, there's that layer of remove. So the girls kind of learn one story and then as you're reading when the girls are more adult they revisit the story and hear kind of what really happened um but I think it's like I wanted to chart this movement from obviously when you're a kid and you hear about violence it's damaging um and like but there's all these adults who maybe try to shield you like they try to shield the characters, but I would say it like casts a shadow on the, both of the characters that they move away and they grow up, but they come back to the violence to try to understand it. Um, and I think the reason I talked about the cultural violence is that both characters in a sense are trying to sort out these different experiences of violence. And one girl goes to Vancouver and is in there when, um, the Picton case like comes, kind of becomes the media story. Um, and she, I think there's that sense I wanted to give of Canada is a safe country. You know, this American character who moves to Canada and it's like, well, we're there, they're more enlightened here. They're not gonna just, you know, I was in a cowboy Western place and now I'm in Vancouver. It must be nicer here. And then, I think she kind of is like, it, it's like having that rug pulled out that you, you want a rug, you want to feel like there's a safe and civilized place where people just won't hurt each other and there's not this sort of system of violence. And then I think that kind of getting pulled away a little bit. Um, so both girls, I think, grow up to try to sort out early violence that they were in proximity to. I mean, she's actually, um, I never know quite how to pronounce Tacoon, um, this French collective um, who c kind of write these books. There's this, um, what's it called? The full, full title is Collected Notes on the Theory of the Young Girl. Um, and that book was translated by Ariana Raines into English and um, Semiotex published it. So Chris Krause sort of was you know aware of this text and this text is simultaneously like really interesting to me and really problematic um where this anonymous collective could have women like you don't kind of they use the the figure of the young girl to sort of talk about our place as consumers or 
kind of disempowered subjects in our current economic climate. Um, so they're really critical of the, the figure of the young girl, and they use all this text from... Um, or maybe, I don't know if, you know, it's like a porous kind of like, are they using, quoting, you know, f women's magazines and this sort of like, make yourself more beautiful and, you know, the self as like a consuming and object to be consumed. Um, and they say in the beginning of that book, like, we don't really mean young girls. We don't really mean a feminine subject. We could mean, you know, Berlusconi is a young girl. And I always found that, I was reading it and I was like, I get what you guys are saying, but it's hugely problematic to me to sort of say, saying young girl isn't to do with actual young girls. And so I feel like I took on this sort of challenge, like wanting to write back to that book and sort of say, okay, well, I was a young girl <laughs> um, and young girls are real people in the world. So it's, you can't write a book and sort of just use anybody and say, well, that's just a symbol. So I think Chris was s responding to this kind of like coming from the inside of that figure and that figure getting treated like only an outside. I was telling, I was talking about the book to someone and, and sort of saying that there's a lot of theory, like feminist theory that would say, you know, women learn to think of themselves both from the inside and then also to imagine how they're being seen. And it's a big part of identifying as female in this culture is like identifying as something from the outside, like your surface, your makeup, your how you appear, regar almost regardless of how you feel. Or, you know, you try to arrange yourself so you can be kind of pretty and approachable and nice and, and all these things. And so then there's that maybe distance from the inside and the outside. And I was saying this to someone and they were like, well, everyone feels that, of course, like there is that we have multiple selves and we care about how the outside sees us. But I think it's especially intense for women and I think it's especially, especially intense for young women to sort of learn who you are. And so much of it is like, well, I am what I appear to be. Um, and I think this kind of, like you, I think the also the other thing, it's like our, our physical bodies, you know, especially, you know, women's bodies, I wanted to talk about how historically and in the present, you know, you are a, you are a being, you are a physical being, um, but then that being is objectified and then it also is, you know, labor objectifies it further potentially. Um, so it's this idea of the shopper, the shop girl, the, the woman working in the factory, and then the thing itself as like images that you buy from films or all these like the image making that is layered on top of every female experience. Um, so it's like these, both these girl characters like pursue higher education and you learn about this stuff. These, these characters learn about it, but they still, you, just because you learn something doesn't mean you're outside of it. Um, so, so I think it's like this, I really wanted to give that sensation of double, triple layers. Like I am a, I'm a person but I'm also an object and that object could be very valuable or totally worthless. Um, and I was definitely responding to um, Roberto Bolaño's 2666 and a lot of writing about Juarez that, uh, and then I would say like the Picton trials, it's like when a body, when someone dies, their body does become the, this object and then like being treated like precious or fetishized or garbage. And that sort of, if you walk around with that awareness of the potential of the body that you live in, it's, it's like kind of creates a vertigo.
that you then navigate. Something that was important to me that it's, uh, I haven't really talked to anyone or no one's asked me about it explicitly, but I'm really happy that there's these certain like, this idea of a spell was important to me. And, and uh, when I grew up, or I was very like dyslexic, I am dyslexic. And it's this, I got a lot of flack as a kid for being a bad speller. And then only in the last working on the book, I was thinking about spelling and its relationship with writing words down and then also witchcraft or magic, like um, the Kabbalah, like there's a lot of that idea of like putting the right words together, the right letters, and then you make something happen. Um, and then like a numerological quality. So one thing that I am happy that the, has in the book is like there's this like 69 chapters and then 108 and the 69 being the sort of like profane number that is a circular and then 108 being um, from yoga, like how many, this idea of repetition and sort of perfection. Um, so that was like really pleasing to me. And then just the little parts where it's like, you know, you break off from a story to make something like happen with words, which is what I think poetry can do. So it's like incantation. So that's one part I like that I'm personally happy with, like got it in there in some way. Um, this is a quote from Takun, um, The Theory of the Young Girl. The young girl is an instrument in service to a general politics of the extermination of beings capable of love. Identical in this to the alienated social whole, the young girl hates sorrow because sorrow condemns her just as it condemns this society. In the girl's hometown, the smell of roasting chilies fills the fall air. In winter, only light coats are needed. Winds whip springs and burning rays blanch summers. Old buildings are made of dried mud bricks and newer buildings of stacked cinder blocks or framed walls stuccoed. In the nicer neighborhoods, homeowners pay landscapers to fill their yards with volcanic rock and cacti because water is too precious for lawns. In poorer neighborhoods, people beat the dust hard by parking cars out front. Kids cough, elbows cracks, crack, elbows crack and the backs of necks go brown beneath the sun. In the girl's hometown, the pecan orchards grow in grids. In spring, farmers flood them and the water reflects the sky, making an optical illusion, a world mirror. Next to one orchard, there is a rowboat stuck in the sand. Who knows how it got there? The girls like to sit in this boat. It is one of their secret spots. Every few miles along the border is an officer in an SUV. During the day, they sit drinking truck stop coffee out of styrofoam. After lunch, silvery paper wrappings of burgers or burritos lay bald on the dash. At night, they spike a fresh coffee with an airline-sized bottle of alcohol, whatever it takes to keep alert. Each officer is in radio contact with partners. Their headlights penetrate the desert. By magic or design, disaster is expected. To expect is to call into being. A Feta Morgana playing across the highway creates a vertical stack of images. There appears to be a red velvet curtain. A spotlight is switched on and two girls step into its circle. One is dressed in a pair of cutoffs and a t-shirt that reads, here comes trouble. The other has on a man's jacket over her mini dress. Their faces are puffy like they've been cr just been crying or drinking, 
maybe both, both. They address their audience. By speaking, they begin to make themselves human. These are girls, not as bodies, not as parts, but as human beings alive. It is amazing that this must be said, but it must. Such recognition is not a given, it is a fight. Call us Celine and Julie. Those are not our real names, but ones we like. Names worthy of girls, worthy of desire. We assumed them from characters in our favorite film. Think of us as the understudies. Celine and Julie are sinners fleeing on we. What grips their insides is a knowledge of their value, their worthlessness. They flee because, in their world, existence hinges on a litany of imperatives. Be pretty, charm, adapt to threat. The lesson might be summarized as, be good or else. In, re in rejecting this, Celine and Julie go towards the unknown, gripped by fever, tormented by remorse, but forever pure in their vices, forever human as we are. The harms Celine and Julie perpetrate are mostly against themselves, but they believe these actions to have a higher purpose. In risking themselves, they try to save others, selves, future, past. They live their lives caught in messes of afternoon obsessions and delights. They wear their vices airbrushed on t-shirts. Laugh now, cry layers. The world is yours, ours. If we had been born men, you would call on genius ghosts to validate our sins. But Celine is not Celine and Julie is not Baudelaire. Girls are not Genets, you degenerate. Crucis is no Paris, and there is no way we are going to make it to the end of this night. Celine and Julie roll their eyes across the Dodge Ram Charger's deep blue interior. They repeat the spell that starts the play afresh. You have to write or remain silent. The moonlight spotlight fades to black. Our cities are mirrors facing one another to create a claustrophobic infinity. Stealth jets no one can see leave fantastical gaseous clouds over the changeable purple-blue-gray Oregon mountains. So far, so close. This is about a world with ghost towns and company towns with cul-de-sacs and long paved roads. Gas stations and churches, community theaters, and shanty neighborhoods on their edges. This is about a world with wild and domestic cats, pet parrots and wild roadrunners, and doves and other birds. This is about a world with lonely, depressed horses in small pens and whole herds of wild horses running from helicopters. This is about a world with mothers and women who remind you of your mother about old lovers with long eyelashes and their beautiful new girlfriends who have fucked up teeth. This is about a world with neck and bolo ties, dress shirts and tank tops and skydiving team sweatshirts in turquoise blue. This is about a world with tropical and boreal forests and trade wind and multi-latitude and rain shadowed deserts. This is about a world with napalm and atomic bombs, a world with loaded handguns and razor blades hidden inside cheek pouches. This is about a world with scripts for tragic plays and dictionaries for words like pratfall, charmeuse, and empathy, and more, and more. Girlhood is a stage. The desert is a stage. The landscape is as much an interior as it is a place you can get to by flying southwest. It's cheap, but not easy. It will take all your modern courage. If we can say the right words in the correct way, we can reorder the world. If we can reorganize our fragments, we will begin to understand one another. Redeeming shitty experience is the option. This is the only experience we have. 
After the world of the stage, we must make our entrance into this stage of the world. The stage goes on stage to speak. Spirits possess. Possession is nine-tenths. Turn your head to the side, to the other, other side. Not killers, not victims, not means to ends, but ends in and of themselves. Matter, 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 matter touches you back into being all dark and quiet. Girls appear, Celine and Julie appear on stage, the girls of the law. See, we have parts, but also our parts, not slow or methodical, but repetitive and messy, bodies emboldened, embodied. Illegally crossing, acting out the violence of objectifying beings. When you touch it into being, matter touches you open. The stage goes dark and quiet. Girls appear on stage. Celine and Julie appear to speak on stage. Spirits possess the girls. Possession is nine-tenths of the law. Turn your head to the side to see we have parts, but the other, other side also are parts. Not killers, not victims, not slow or methodical, not means to ends, but repetitive and messy ends in and of themselves, bodies emboldened, embodied. Matter illegally crossing, matter acting out the violence of matter, objectifying beings. Matter, when you touch it, it touches you back into being. Into being, matter touches you all open. <laughs>